Is it possible that this current war, and this is the war that Israel against Hamas, could be a conflict that will bring about the Antichrist who will make the seven-year peace treaty? I'm not saying that this war is prophesied anywhere, but just an occurrence that could introduce the Antichrist. Is it possible that this event precedes the rapture and introduces the Antichrist? So a couple thoughts on this. The dispensation of grace doesn't end because Israel experiences war. What is it that causes the dispensation of grace to end? And I'm going to say it's, it's two things. The first is the body of Christ departs from the truth. And the second thing is the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So I'm going to say a little bit more about each of those things, but let me say this. The human inclination is to make the end of the dispensation of grace coincide with some war or geopolitical event. And that's, you know, there's something you can read about in the papers, and that's what brings about the conclusion of the dispensation of grace. But get with me 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at 1 Timothy 4, and then we'll look at 2 Timothy 3. But we'll start in 1 Timothy 4, and this is going to explain to us what causes the dispensation of grace to come to a conclusion. Verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So this is specifically about the latter times. This is near the end of the dispensation of grace. And what it warns about is it says some shall depart from the faith. It doesn't say lost people will behave terribly. It doesn't say, you know, man's nature is going to cause this and that problem. It specifically focuses on the body of Christ. Because the only way you can depart from the faith is you have to be in the faith. If you're never saved, you, can't, you didn't depart from the faith, right? So what 1 Timothy 4 is warning about is about departing from the faith. What that is saying is the end of the dispensation of grace, is it a time of revival and spirituality and Bible study and doctrinal clarity? It's none of those things. The end of the dispensation of grace, sadly, is the body of Christ departing from the faith. Now, if you notice 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, you see how it says latter times? So, latter is comparative, it's not superlative. What do I mean by that? Tall, taller, tallest. Tall is descriptive. Taller is comparative. Tallest is superlative. So when it says latter times, comparative, it's, it's later. Compare that with 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days. So the latter times come before the last days. The latter times is near the end the last days is at the end. You see that? Times in, in the scripture frequently refers to years. So I'm not saying to revise it, but just read it this way with me for a moment. Latter times is like latter years, the later years, close to the end. Second Timothy 3 1 is the last days, the very end. Second Timothy 3 1 This know also that in the latter last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. 
from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So in 1 Timothy 4, the body of Christ departs from the faith, latter times. In the last days, what happens to mankind? Men shall be lovers of their own selves, etc. All of those negative qualities that are described. You can decide whether or not this is the case, but does the body of Christ's departure from the faith lead to the last days, the perilous times? See, I, I would argue this. You can decide if this is true. The church should have a preservative effect on society. It's not going to be that 100% of, of society is saved. It would be great if it was, but that's not realistic. But when the church is strong and has doctrinal purity and walks according to the scriptures, that has a positive influence on society as a whole because the church can act as a preservative in society. But what happens when the church departs from the faith? Well, when the church departs from the faith, is there actually any moral clarity or standard within society? And the answer is, there isn't. So I would suggest to you that 1 Timothy 4, the latter times, the church departs from the faith, and then what follows naturally from that is when the church ceases to act as that preservative in society, what happens to society? Falls apart, corrodes. You see exactly what you see in 2 Timothy 3. Now, I, I just, I'm just going to note a couple things on this before we go on. For of this sort, verse 6, for of this sort are they which creep into houses... I am just intrigued by that phrasing. And the reason why is there is more wickedness that enters your house through electrical cables than has happened in the preceding hundreds and hundreds of years, right? And it creeps in. And, 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 and unless you monitor it and are vigilant about it, you're going to be exposed to it constantly. Now, if you notice verse 7, ever learning, we live in what's called the information age. So we've never had access to more information. At the touch, you know, on a, on a simple phone, you can access the world's information. People are learning constantly. But notice what verse 7 says, ever learning and able, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I'll make this observation. If you learn, 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 and acquire great worldly wisdom, but you don't get saved, utter foolishness, right? Because you, you, you have not prioritized the single most important thing that you need to learn. You need to learn, how do I save? How do I protect my eternal destiny? How do I avoid spending eternity in the lake of fire? Isn't that the fundamental question that everyone has to answer? Yes. So if, imagine acquiring the world's wisdom and not solving that question. What a, what a tragic, utter mistake. And, and, and that's, that's what happens at the end of the dispensation of grace. Man is ever learning and yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now let's go back to Romans 11.25. We were there just a few moments ago, but I want you to see something. Romans 11.25. Now this is the description of what what occurs at the end of the dispensation of grace. Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Now that part is fascinating. What happens when people are ignorant of the Pauline mysteries? Well, what happens to them spiritually is they're wise in their own conceits. Is, let me ask you this. Is it a good thing to be conceited? It's not. What, what Conceit is arrogance. It's haughtiness. It's pride. Wise in their own conceits is a way of saying you're arrogant 
and you think you know something, but you really don't. It's not scriptural wisdom. It's not godly wisdom. It, 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 it's, it's man's arrogant wisdom thinking he knows something that he doesn't. When you're ignorant of the Pauline mysteries, you end up not spiritually wise. You end up wise in your own conceits. You're, you're proud and you know nothing. A great cross-reference for that is 1 Timothy 6, 3 and 4. We won't go there. But now notice this, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. It's that last phrase that I want to focus on, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. The dispensation of grace does not end because God runs out of seats in heaven. Does God have so many you know, positions, so many buildings built in heaven. And then once he hits the quota, he says, that's it. I'm not saving anyone else. I don't want this place to be overcrowded. That's not what happens. When it refers to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, it's not that God gets tired of saving people. It's that Gentiles reject the offer of salvation. The truly tragic thing about the dispensation of grace, now think about this with me. We looked at Esther 8, 17 a few moments ago. Many people of the land became Jews. There were Gentiles that during Mordecai's time became Jews. They proselyted into the Jewish faith. Now that was a significant decision, obviously. It was, it was a wise decision, but they, they're, they're, they're becoming Jews. They're, they're, they're being circumcised. They're affixing themselves. They're identifying as part of the nation of Israel. It's a significant decision. Today, during the dispensation of grace, a lost Gentile does not have to join Israel, does not have to get circumcised, does not have to do any of those things. All that a lost Gentile today needs to do to be saved is has faith in what Christ did for him. Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So, if you're a Gentile on the earth today, you should think to yourself, well, this is terrific. I lived during a time where all I have to do is I don't have to perform works to manifest my faith. I don't have to join the nation of Israel. I don't have to do any, you know, grand religious deed. All I have to do is trust what Christ did for me. The moment I do that, I'm eternally saved. So what should every single Gentile on the earth do this moment? I accept. If I drove downtown and I just started handing out $100 bills, what would people do? They think I'm crazy, but... They would accept them, right? If someone is there giving away free money, I'm interested. Let's talk. Well, God offers free eternal salvation to all of humanity. Every single person should say, I'm interested, right? But the tragic conclusion of the dispensation of grace is the fullness of the Gentiles comes in because Gentiles as a group say, we don't want it. We're not interested. Well, when Gentiles do that, is there a reason for God to continue the dispensation of grace? The dispensation of grace was an interruption of the prophetic calendar. It gave Gentiles a period of amnesty to get saved before the wrath is poured out when the prophetic clock resumes. Well, when Gentiles say, period of amnesty, why do we want that? We don't want that. We reject it. We're not interested. So God says, I'm sorry to hear that, but I will honor your decision, and we will resume with the prophetic program, and you'll regret that. Right? So, Get with me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll turn there. I'll give you this metaphor. It reminds me of this. There's a hurricane that's coming, and the last bus is leaving. You can get on the bus freely, and it will take you to safety. Or you can say, nope. I want to stay here right in the path of the storm. 
I'm just going to write it out. Well, billions of Gentiles at the end of the dispensation of grace, and, and, and those in Israel as well do this, they refuse to get on the bus. The bus will take them to safety. It's free. All you got to do, get on the bus. You'll be fine. Or you can say, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stand here and just face the storm. That's, that's sadly what happens. So look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. And when we look at 2 Thessalonians, we need to understand when the Antichrist is revealed. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ there is a reference to the rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So verse 3 talks about the man of sin being revealed. Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse 4 is a reference to Daniel 9, 27. It's a reference to Matthew 24, 15. It's a reference to the abomination of desolation. In other words, what happens during the 70th week is the man of sin, what people commonly call the Antichrist, the beast, the wicked one, the vile person. He goes into the temple and declares himself to be God. And that's an abomination. It's an abomination that maketh desolate. Now, notice with me verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now, notice verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. I'm not going to take the time to get into this deeply. But when you see the phrase mystery of iniquity, what comes to your mind as its counterpart? The mystery of godliness. So 1 Timothy 3.16 talks about the mystery of godliness, and it's a reference to the body of Christ. It's a reference to what God is doing today to form the body of Christ and to save as much of humanity as will be saved. The mystery of iniquity is the satanic response to the mystery of godliness. Notice verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity, it says, doth already work. So here's what happens. If you think of when Israel goes into Egypt, Israel goes into Egypt, Satan can tell that they're there, he sees they're there, but he knows that God has previously promised that he's going to bring Israel into the land of Canaan. So what does Satan do? Well, I know Israel's going to be over there for a while, but I know ultimately they're coming over here. So what that means is as long as they're over there, I can prepare. And, and when Israel comes into the land, they find giants. Scripture also says they find fortified cities. Why were they fortified? Because Satan knew sooner or later... God's going to bring them into the promised land, and I'm going to resist them. Well, how am I going to resist them? I'm going to prepare, prepare, prepare. I'm going to fortify the cities. I'm going to have giants in the land so that when God tries to bring them in, we're going to have a fight. So now think about this with me. In the middle of the book of Acts, God interrupts the prophetic calendar. He puts the prophetic calendar on hold. He didn't destroy the prophetic calendar. He just called time out. So if you're Satan... What does that tell you? What that means is there's now more time for me to prepare for the, the end events of the prophetic calendar. And so what Satan does, God has the mystery of godliness. So Satan says, well, I'm going to have my own, but my mystery is not going to be godly. It's going to be iniquity. And the mystery of iniquity doth already work when 2 Thessalonians was written. It's still working today. Now, notice with me the end of verse 7. Only he who now letteth will let 
until he be taken out of the way. That which lets, that which holds back, is the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ. As long as the dispensation of grace is in place, the mystery of iniquity is held back. Or, or, or more specifically, the fulfillment of it. Now, notice verse 8. And let me read verse 7 and 8 together. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That happens at the rapture. Now, notice what it then says. And then shall that wicked be revealed. So what does that tell you about people trying to identify the beast during the dispensation of grace? It's impossible because he hasn't been revealed. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, the dispensation of grace holds back the man of sin, until he be taken out of the way at the catching up, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Well, you can't identify the Antichrist today because he hasn't been revealed. It's completely and utterly impossible. So how should we think about this, this current war? Will it bring about the Antichrist who will make the seven-year peace treaty? And the answer to that is no, because there is nothing that happens during the dispensation of grace that reveals the Antichrist. He's not revealed until after the dispensation of grace is already over.